Hello, everybody. In the uh, last lecture, we talked about mean value theorem and intermediate value theorem, and we reviewed them because I said that they would come up later in the course. But there's one other big theorem that will play a huge role in our course and be used all over the place. And it's one that you learned a lot about last year uh, in first year calculus, almost certainly, and that's Taylor's theorem. But we're going to kind of cast it in a different way and uh, dig into it a little bit more deeply to see what it means for polynomials to approximate true functions and how to figure out the errors that are associated with those approximations. So let's dig right into it and talk about Taylor's Theorem Revisited. So as I said, it's going to be really important that we get some of those basics down. We're going to do some stuff with graphs and, and such as well. And if you would like, you can use online graphing software to reproduce any of these or come up with some of your own examples just to lead to some better understanding. So for all of this, what we're doing here, we're going to let f be an infinitely differentiable function at some sort of point of interest, x equals x0. So in other words, we're going to just make sure that the derivative, the second derivative, etc., all the different derivatives that you can think of, they all exist. As a motivation for this whole thing, we're going to consider the first principles definition of the derivative. That is, the one that is described by limits from last year, the one that you were first introduced to derivatives by uh, back in the day, the limit of the slopes of secant lines. F prime at x0 is equal to a limit as x gets really, really close to x0 of the rise over the run, f of x minus f of x0 over x minus x0. Okay, in that limit, as x gets infinitesimally or infinitely close to x0, uh, that's the definition of what f prime is. But what we're going to do is say, well, what happens if it's not necessarily infinitely close? Let's just let x be somewhat close to x0. For x near x0, maybe we can say that the derivative is close to that f of x minus f of x0 over x minus x0. If the x is close to the x0, then the slope of that secant line becomes a good approximation of what the derivative is um, at x0. I can take this, uh, this almost inequality and rearrange for f of x. If I do, I get this, f prime of x0 times x minus x0, no problem multiplying up by this thing, that thing's not zero, if x is away from x0, that thing's not zero anyway. I get that this thing is almost equal to f of x minus f of x0. And if I do like I ask in my instructions to myself, it says rearrange for f of x and I get f of x is equal to almost f of x zero plus f prime of x zero times x minus x zero. Now there's something a little bit weird here. I said approximately equal to some stuff. And then the next line says writing this as an equation. It turns out that when you have that something's approximately equal to something else, you can instead write it as an equality with an extra term to kind of soak up the difference. So I could say that f of x is equal to f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0 plus some sort of error. If this sounds really weird to you and you're not sure if you believe it, I just want you to think a little bit about an example. I'm going to say think. I would say that maybe you'd agree 7 is pretty close to 6.9. Right? Or maybe better yet, maybe I can swap that around and say, if you have 6.9, maybe you just want to approximate that by 7. Either way, okay? But I could equally well say that 6.9 is equal to, certainly equal to, that 7 plus some sort of error term, how much I'm off by. And that way, maybe you'll be able to kind of buy what I wrote in the last line a little bit more. Instead of writing, instead of writing some sort of hazy little, uh, like approximately equal to thing that I don't really know what that is, I could instead write a solid equal sign as long as I account for that equality, that difference with some sort of little error term to soak up the difference. 6.9 is equal to seven plus some little bit, that minus 0.1 difference. That's the error. We're going to be doing a lot of this, saying that a quantity is equal to something else plus something that makes up a difference. 
that difference is going to be the error. So thinking of what this is saying now, what this equation right here is saying now, that says that f of x, okay, if x is near x0, so that second term there is something very small, f of x is well approximated, um, or f of x is, is uh, well approximated by this linear quantity plus some sort of error term that makes that difference, okay? What is that error? Well, we're going to explore that in the next couple, couple of pages. So bear with me. We'll get to something a little bit more precise in a few minutes. Okay, as you know, we can actually do better than a linear approximation. We can come up with much better approximations. Taylor's theorem uh, goes into great detail about that. And with infinitely differentiable functions, you can come up with infinite polynomials that uh, are, are actually equal to the uh, function you're interested in approximating. So uh, within some radius of convergence, for those people who have that language, maybe those of you who took advanced calculus talked a little bit of radius of convergence and stuff like that, we can say that such functions, uh, those that are infinitely differentiable, uh, we can represent them by particular infinite polynomials centered at that point. We know lots of them. Uh, you probably have memorized a few of them from last year. e to the x is a really good example. Its Taylor expansion is given by all of the x to the n over n factorials added together. 1, it's like when n is equal to 0. 1, so x to the 0 over 0 factorial. Plus x, that's n equals 1 plus x squared over 2, plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on and so forth. And you probably, in the past, hand-waved and said, oh, the more terms you take, the better the approximation is. We're going to see that with our eyes as we actually graph some of these things today and try to uh, quantify that error a little bit. Okay, note that we only achieve equality here if we in include every term of this infinite polynomial. So if you truncate this equation at any point, right there, you get an approximation of e to the x within some neighborhood. You get an approximation. And that approximation could be first degree, second degree, third degree, eighth degree, like however many terms you take. A third degree approximation of e to the x is therefore given by, well, e to the x would be approximately equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial, or 6. This is the cubic that does the best job of representing e to the x near x equals 0. Um, and what's interesting here is that I can actually use the, the same logic as I did a page ago to take this approximately equal to thing and turn it into an actual equation. So I could write this instead as e to the x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus some error and what I would like to point out is that I can see exactly what that error is by in fact solving for it which is pretty weird, right? But it should make a lot of sense. Our error, which we still don't know exactly what it looks like, is equal to, if I take that e to the x and I subtract, subtract that polynomial approximation, I can see exactly what the error is. And if I know what the graph of e to the x is, and I know what the polynomial is, you can actually graph that too. So in the next couple of pages, I'm going to, uh, to show off the different polynomial approximations for the first few degrees, the first few Taylor expansions, um, or Taylor approximating polynomials for e to the x. That's right here. And we're going to compare that to the associated error. And it's kind of interesting to see. So in the first graph here, we have the zero degree uh, uh, Taylor polynomial. So this is going to be uh, the function p0 of x, that's just the constant term, that's just 1. That's the best possible constant to approximate e to the x within some radius of x equals 0. In the second one, we have the first 
degree Taylor approximation, 1 plus x. In the next one, we have p2 of x, which is going to include all of the terms up until the quadratic term. And in the last one here, this is a cubic. The cubic that does the best job is the one that we wrote in the last page, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial. So this is nothing more, right? These are graphs that you can, can graph without ever knowing what e to the x are, right? Like this is just the graph of 1. It's just the graph of 1 plus x and a quadratic and a cubic. And you could use graphing software. You could use curve sketching if you wanted to to figure out what these are. And you see that the more terms you take, maybe you can see that they, the, the curves kind of hug what you'd expect an exponential to look like um, around x equals 0. Now what we're going to do is tap into what we said before. The error term for the pi functions, as I kind of mentioned before, is literally how far off each approximation is from the true function. The error terms themselves are the functions of x, like I wrote down before. You could take our function, in this case it's e to the x, and subtract the polynomial pieces off it to see what the different error, uh, error terms would look like. And they must be functions of x, right? We wrote it down in the last page, if I go up here. The error for this would be e to the x, the true function, minus the associated or the, the Taylor uh, polynomial approximation. So the error for the third degree approximation is literally e to the x minus that, that approximation, which itself is a function of x. So what we're going to do is look at the graphs of r0, r1, r2, and r3 for exponential function. All that these are are, well, it's e to the x minus the first graph from the last page, the p0 of x. And the second one here is e to the x minus p1 of x. e to the x minus p2 of x. And e to the x minus p3 of x. These are all functions. You can graph them just fine. And there's something quite striking about them. That as you go up the degrees, you can see that they get further and further and further squished towards zero because the polynomial is closer to that exponential function. And so the more terms you take, the, the longer, the closer it, it is very, very near zero before it kind of starts to blow up and go away. And it's going to be higher order terms that help to keep flattening it further. Really cool stuff. But the amount the error decreases is itself a function. That's the concept that I want you to get from this. It's not the matter of it being some particular number. Right? It's something that increases according to some sort of function. And we're going to pin that down using mean value theorem. So it seems that all of the different error functions, these Rn's, are diminishing. As the, as the n increases, they get flattened towards zero. That should make a lot of sense because all of the different polynomials are getting closer and closer to the true f. As I said, we're going to dive a little bit into mean value theorem. We're not going to go into all the details here, but I want you to be to, to understand the motivation, what uh, why the error term will be what it is, and, and the clues to that lie in mean value theorem. Mean value theorem tells us, and this is from last class, this is from last year, there is some c in between x and x0 such that this is true, that f prime of c is equal to f of x minus f of x0 over x minus x0. As a result, we get that f of x is equal to f of x0 plus f prime of c times x minus x0. It's just if I rearrange for the x, or for the f of x, rather. But I want you to take a look at this in the same sort of light that we have for a couple of, of discussion points so far. If x is near x0, this is going to be small. And that means that this term in general is likely to be a little small correction of some sort. I want you to think of f of x being approximated by f of x0, that f of x is close to f, f of x0, that this here is an approximation, a constant approximation for f of x, plus some sort of error term. So this here is an approximation of f that is constant 
And the error term here that is associated, that mean value theorem gets us, is linear. f of x is equal to some constant plus some correction. The correction piece is one degree higher than that constant. And then it depends on this, this first derivative piece. For some c in between x and x0, this is true. And as a matter of fact, you can use this result and uh, essentially a more general version of mean value theorem to find uh, the error associated with higher degree approximations. So it, it turns out that for each pn, for each pn of x, the error rn of x is a function that is in the same sort of way that's driven by mean value theorem up here, the, the error is always one degree higher and one that depends on the n plus first derivative. And that's evaluated at some c between x0 and x. So how does this look like in terms of the equation? Well, let's go back. Let's think of what Taylor's theorem says in terms of the theorem, but we're going to include some sort of error term. And it's going to look really scary, but I don't want you to worry too much about it. The point is that the error is one degree higher. That's everything from this, okay? So suppose that f is a function that is infinitely differentiable at the point x0. Then we can say that f of x is equal to a polynomial approximation plus some associated error. And that associated error is itself a function that is one degree higher than the polynomial approximation. And that is going to be this here. This is the polynomial. This is the Taylor polynomial. Which, right, looks really scary, but all it's doing is taking ever-increasing powers of i. Do you know this is a Taylor polynomial that you can uh, discover and calculate the same way that you would have taught, been taught in first year? And this here is, again, the associated error. Okay, and this is true, this is exactly true for some c between the x0 and the x, just like you have that result for mean value theorem with some c between the x0 and the x. Okay, we're going to be using this a lot, so I want you to, to uh, remember how this works. Remember this idea of polynomial plus error, um, but also we have a couple of different ways that might be useful uh, to write down. There are some times in the course where it may be useful to write Taylor's theorem in terms of the difference, h, the distance between x and x0. And in this case, we get something that looks like this. All we've done here, all we've done here is say that, well, okay, if h is equal to x minus x0, then I can replace each of these by nothing more than powers of h. No problem there. And also, f of x is going to look like f of x0 plus h simply because of this substitution. So there may be times when this comes in really handy. We're going to see that later in the course. So I just want to talk about that now. Okay, looks really weird. Again, just remember the, the, the key points with this thing. Uh, and we're going to do an example to try and see how this can be useful. We're going to work with e to the x for this example because I think that it's a, an easy Taylor polynomial to work with and maybe you'll be able to see um, uh, what the point is. So let Pn be the nth order Taylor polynomials for e to the x about x equals zero. So the center point is x zero equals zero. What this example is asking is find the degree of the polynomial such that that approximating polynomial is within one ten thousandth of the true function for all of the x's between minus one and one. So let's let's just kind of digest that a little bit. Remember that the higher that the degrees are, the closer that the function hugs the true function, right? The closer that the Taylor approximation is going to hug the true. We want to figure out how high of a degree we need to make sure that all of the values of the polynomial are within one ten thousandth of the true between minus one and one. That's what the idea of this is, and we have the tools that we need by looking at our, um, at our uh, uh, 
a way of writing down error. So let's see, let's see. We can write down that e to the x is equal to that Taylor polynomial plus the associated error. And that's going to be this, just writing down from the theorem on the last page, we have all of the different of po powers of x to the n over n factorial, this is the Taylor polynomial, approximation, <clears throat> and this here is that error term. Okay, let's think about this. The error term involves the n plus first derivative of c. And the n plus first derivative of c is not that hard to calculate. Agreed? The n plus first derivative of uh, uh, evaluated at c is going to be the n plus first derivative of e to the x evaluated at c. And I'm going to say that all derivatives all derivatives of e to the x are easy, right? f prime is equal to e to the x, f double prime equals e to the x, and so on. So what do you suppose the n plus first derivative evaluated at c is going to be? I can easily say that the n plus first derivative evaluated at c must be, oops, not, in a, lot, not a lot of room there, must be equal to e to the x evaluated at c, it's e to the c. And that's how I'm going to put here this e to the c. Okay, so really, uh, if I'm trying to think about what that error term has to be, and I want to show that, uh, or I want to find n so that that error term is less than 10 to the minus 4, it's going to be helpful to kind of boil that down to something simpler so that I can kind of test different values and see um, for what n that is true. So I'm going to take that n plus first derivative and replace it by e to the c as a good start to this. We're dealing with values of x between minus 1 to 1. If x is between minus 1 and 1 and the center point is 0 and my c is found between x0 and x, that means I'm going to be finding, uh, uh, considering c values to be between minus 1 and 1 as uh, as well, if you think about this, because I'm finding values between 0 and x, whatever the x is, and x is between minus 1 and 1. The c is always between the two, so the c can never be higher than 1, the c can never be lower than minus 1. So we need to determine for which values of n we have that this quantity right here, e to the c over n plus 1 factorial uh, times x to the n plus 1 is less than 10 to the minus 4. That's literally saying that the error, the error is less than 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so we want to do some crude sorts of bounding. Um, so let's do that, let's do that. Uh, for example, we know for all of the x in the interval we're interested in, that is for all of the x between minus 1 and 1, we're trying to make this quantity kind of as big as possible because we want to see uh, for what values, all different values of x are less than that 10 to the minus 4. And if I take the very largest possibility and put that to be less than 10 to the minus 4, then I can find uh, what I need. So if we set this largest quantity to be less than 10 to the minus 4, this right here, then uh, so must this be as well. So if this quantity is less than 10 to the minus 4, the one on the left will be as well. The idea is to make this thing as large as possible and therefore uh, have something that's set up and ready to solve for the n. So that leads us right here. We have e to the 1 over n plus 1 factorial times 1 to the n plus 1. We want to see for what n value this is less than 10 to the minus 4. So uh, let's do some testing. Let's do some testing here. Uh, it's actually not hard to do uh, just by thinking about different values of n that make sense in here, right? We're only thinking about integer values because we're thinking about um, degrees of polynomials. Degrees of polynomials must be positive integers. So no problem there. Um, yeah, uh, let's see here. So if, if you, for example, think of n equals 1, you'd get like e over 1 plus 1 factorial is e over 2. 
E over 2 is like 2.7 over 2, that's 1.3. 1.3 is not less than 10 to the minus 4. So it must be a higher value of n than that. The 1 to the n plus 1 here, well, we don't really have to worry about this too much because this here is always equal to 1. And so, yeah. Let's test some different values of n. To find the first, the first one to make this inequality true. Okay, so let's see, what's, what's reasonable here? If we try out if we try out n equals, I wrote down some, some, some trials, n equals 5, I thought was a reasonable place to start. If we get n equals 5, we end up with uh, e to the 1 over 6 factorial is less than 10 to the minus 4. Okay, and the question is, is that true or not? If you take e and you divide it by 6 factorial, do you find that it is less than 10 to the minus 4? And, well, you can test it out for yourself, but e over 6 factorial, e over 6 factorial is about 2.7 divided by 6, I've got my calculator open as we speak, it's equal to 0 0.00375, and that is not less, not less than uh, the 10 to the minus 4. So that's not it. But then you keep keep trying. n equals 6. n equals 6 will lead to e to the 1 over 7 factorial, less than 10 to the minus 4. And if you shove that into a calculator, if you shove that into a calculator, you end up with yeah, like 5.357 times 10 to the minus 4, something like that. And that is not less than uh, 10 to the minus 4. So that is also not true. And essentially, you want to just kind of brute force it until you figure out the, uh, the first value of n for which this is true. And if you go to n equals 7, this will be the first time. We get e to the 1 over 8 factorial, summing that in, less than 10 to the minus 4. And this here is true for the first time. And you can verify that simply by shoving this into your calculator. So uh, let's see here, let's see here. So n equals seven is the first value for which this uh, equation is true, or this inequality is true. What does that say? That means we would need a seventh order uh, Taylor polynomial approximation to ensure that it is accurate to within 10 to the minus four for all x between minus one and one. So I want to uh, just kind of reiterate what this was all about. We have this Taylor's theorem. It gives us an error term. I can take that error term and say, I want that to be less than 10 to the minus four. That's exactly what we did. So if we have that that error term is less than 10 to the minus four, I want to kind of uh, work with that error term to, uh, to make it as simple as possible to solve for the possible n values. And I know that for x between minus 1 and 1, the c also has to be between minus 1 and 1. I want to bound that to be as large as possible, because if that quantity is less than 10 to the minus 4, then certainly the error term is also going to be less than 10 to the minus 4. That's what we did. We built the error to be up as large as possible, basically by subbing in the c and x values that make it as large as possible, and then tested different values of n to find the first one that makes that true. Because 
that would guarantee that the original error is also within that 10 to the minus 4. A little bit challenging, right? A little bit challenging. Um, there are a couple of details here, right? That quantity, that error term, was always going to be positive due to the, uh, the nature of the functions that are involved. But as a matter of fact, you in general probably want to deal with um, something that involves an absolute, uh, an absolute error to deal with a problem like this. So keep, it, keep that in mind. Right? Because I could say that you know some crazy big negative quantity is less than 10 to the minus 4. And clearly, clearly that's not in the spirit of the question. You want to make sure that it's within 10 to the minus 4. Um, so you'd want to use uh, the, the, potentially the absolute uh, value of that error in order to work with a problem like this. It's just due to the nature of the exponentials here that let us uh, kind of not worry about that. But that might come in handy when it comes to some certain homework questions. Um, yeah. So uh, let's kind of wrap it up here and talk about where we're going to go from here. Because uh, this, this concept of approximating things and considering error is a huge spirit of this course. It's something that's going to come up again and again and again. We're going to talk about more ways of measuring error and talking about uh, a kind of interesting way of measuring how fast things increase and decrease since we'll, we'll be uh, associating a lot of that with those conversations with error in a topic called asymptotics. So those things are going to be coming up soon in these lectures. Um, hopefully this made some sense, but you're more than welcome to contact me at any time if you have any trouble at all. Uh, work on the homework when you get the chance, and I'll see you in the next lecture. So bye for now, everybody.